Um, filmmakers have often grappled with how to build and structure their broader framework of how to tell the story or about the larger consequences of the struggle. And a number of very important early films about the Civil War were very much captive to what we in the historical profession and outside the profession call the lost cause myth, or the Gone with the Wind model, or the Midnight in Magnolia, Mint Juleps uh, model. Many subsequent films followed suit. The lost cause, essentially, uh, is a southern point of view. And the southern point of view is that um, the war was brought upon Southerners. They were very reluctant about it. They simply were defending their way of life against northern intrusion, that it was a constitutional usurpation of power by the North, that the South was only defending itself against <coughs> invading, marauding Northerners who then wore down the South because of their uh, superiority, certainly in resources and numbers. And at the end of the war, the South had to abandon it. The South has laid to waste. Worse than northern Yankee opportunistic carpetbaggers come down into the South. Carpetbaggers, for those of you who don't know, were, were uh, middle-of-the-road politicians and men of moderate means and others who weren't able to afford luggage at the time, and so they would often staple pieces of carpet, a piece of carpet together, put a handle on it, uh, as their suitcase. They were called carpetbaggers derisively. Carpetbaggers came down into the South and then along with their allies, the free uh, black race will, will then unleash havoc on the poor uh, Southern society, disenfranchising uh, men of means and of power, uh, and then enfranchising blacks and opportunistic whites who were not ready for the challenge and then uh, passed all kinds of obnoxious laws and did all kinds of obnoxious things to these poor defeated Southerners. And only then, when organizations like the Ku Klux Klan are formed, will the South then be redeemed from these, from these uh, uh, northern marauding swarms that have come down into the four innocent South. That's the law, in essence, it's, I'm simplifying a very complicated myth, but it's the lost cause myth. And you certainly see it in the first film that I'm going to deal with, The Birth of the Nation. And then you're also going to see it particularly in, with Gone with the Wind. In it, part of what the problem is, is that historians, southern historians, will, will advance elements of these ideas completely based on falsehoods, and uh, erroneous ideas about what actually happened. And in it, blacks are, are either they were docile, loyal slaves who supported their masters in the cause, or they are conniving, uh, beady-eyed, uh, suspicious-looking blacks who really covet all that whites had in the South and want to take it over. And it's not until, as I say, Southern gentlemen, the patrician class, the aristocratic class, can then ex exert its muscle by the late 1870s or so, and then kick the carpetbaggers out and begin the process of putting blacks in their rightful place that the South then can really become restored to its true and earlier glorious self. And as I said, the, probably the best, or maybe the worst expression of this is in, um, is in Birth of a Nation and then that monumental film, Gone with the Wind. More recent films in our past have explored a whole lot more honestly the centrality of African Americans and the complexities posed by emancipation. Uh, Glory, which came out in 1989, and much more recently, Lincoln, uh, just last year. We'll do both of this to varying degrees of success. And so a lot of what has had to happen in the last uh, 50 years or so in Hollywood filmmaking is this earlier lost cause way uh, mode of thinking has been supplanted in, in a large measure because of the civil rights struggles of the 1960s and the women's movement and other social movements. 
and political movement since then. You see that being expressed now in the filmmaking. There's also been a great historical revolution that has occurred too in thoroughly discounting a lot of these other earlier historical accounts of the South that was, again, run over by swarms of these opportunistic Northerners and their black allies trying to do whatever they could to disrupt this old Southern way and noble way of life. The first is the birth of, birth of a nation. And the birth of a nation came out in 1915. Uh, it's a D.W. Griffith film. A film scholars look at it today. It's a monumental piece of technological achievement because of uh, what Griffith was managed to do in this film. It is uh, three hours in length, epic in scope. It's a silent film, but it is based on a novel that came out in the 1880s by a fellow by the name of Thomas Dixon called The Klansman. And it embraces hook, line, and sinker, this lost cause mythology. Blacks are, you know, were happy. They were happy in slavery. They mostly were docile, and they were loyal and obedient, and then everything was turned upside down when the North invaded and then tried to force emancipation and equality on, uh, on a southern population, a southern black population that was not equipped to handle it, uh, and a white population that simply was disempowered and defamed and had to stand idly by and watch this. Um, the film is, the first part of the film follows a, a, fam, a southern family. They go off, the men go off to the war, and Griffith then follows uh, the family through its, uh, the men on the battlefront. Uh, there are battle scenes for the first, big epic battle scenes in, uh, for the first time in film history. You've got, uh, uh, you have got things like uh, uh, Lincoln being assassinated on film for the first time. You have uh, Lee surrendering to Grant. All of these images are part of the early part of the film. The second part of the film, though, begins the lost cause, uh, begins you know, forcing the lost cause imagery onto the viewing public. What's tragic about this film is that Woodrow Wilson was the president of the United States at the time, and they, they, he'd been uh, trained at Princeton. He'd gotten a PhD in political science and history uh, in the late 19th century, said that it's like writing history with lightning. And he, would, he had a private White House showing of it, and he said, my only regret is that it is also terribly true. And what the film does ultimately is glorify at the conclusion the emergence of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan rides to the rescue uh, and you know, beats out these nasty carpetbaggers, makes sure that blacks realize their proper place in this new South and uh, the day is saved. So uh, you've got you know, the blessing of the President of the United States on this film. Uh, here is, is still from it. You've got uh, the soldiers riding off to battle in the Southern Bells, of course, uh, waving them off goodbye tearfully. You've got uh, some battle scenes here heroically. Uh, you know, the Confederates hold out the redoubt against charge after charge after charge. You've got the recreation of the Grant Lee surrender at Appomattox in April of 1865, and then just a few days later, tragically, you've got Lincoln that Griffith treats very benevolently in the film, even though he's a Southerner. The feeling was that if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, uh, all of this black radicalism in the South could have been prevented, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, Lincoln was enlightened enough that he would have allowed the white patrician class to uh, retake power. It is a decidedly strange way to, to look at history. But, and it's a decidedly um, distorted and fabricated way of looking at history in, in some ways to justify basically the emergence of white supremacy and the subjugation of the black race in, in the post-Civil War South. As I said, the second half of the film starts dealing with that period of reconstruction. And this is when you start seeing uh, sulky, 
surly blacks, blacks who are uppity in this period from about 1866 to about 1870 or so. Equality, you see it in the sign, and this is still from the movie Equality. Here we have Election Day. And Election Day, of course, what blacks and their Republican allies want, equality, equal rights, equal politics, and the clincher, equal marriage. Then things start getting really, uh, I think, pretty nasty in the film. You see lots of actors, black actors in 1915, who were, none of them could hold leading roles in a film. And so Griffith cast all of the leading parts with actors in blackface. The leading black actors, anyway, were, would be white actors in blackface. And you've got, um, on the upper, up, up here, you've got uh, a mulatto in blackface here who is uh, attempting to take power in South Carolina in the legislature. He's, a, he's elected lieutenant governor. And on the right, then you see poor whites who are now in chain because of, of minor infractions like not saluting Negro officers in the street and so forth. And then the worst of, of it all is you have black actors or people in dark, uh, in blackface and coveting, you know, the lily white, innocent white women of the South. What I want to show you is a clip to start with here that Griffith uh, staged of and he, he cast it as a historical recreation of the South Carolina legislature under black rule. So you can see firsthand what American audiences were watching in 1915. So let me call her up here.
Wilson will write, and he actually then Griffith used some of Wilson's quotes in the movie itself. We have the President of the United States uh, giving his blessing to this, it adds even more reinforcement. The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until the last there had sprung into existence a great Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South, to protect the Southern country. This is where, of course, these images and the message also coming from Southern historians was we were completely justified in establishing Jim Crow laws, segregation laws after the Civil War. You know, black rule was tried, and boy, what a failure that was. You saw what they did. The historical record, historians have gone back and examined how blacks fared uh, during Reconstruction, particularly blacks in political office, and almost uniformly they ruled uh, in their offices dispassionately, they ruled even handedly, they did not do these atrocious, you know, they did not have these atrocious spectacles, such as Griffith then uh, posited here in this particular film. And it's a way that history then influences, you know, future history. Because Southerners, you know, during the 20th century are going to kick and scream and drag their feet all the way to the Brown versus Board of Education and then the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and beyond. And in large measure, it's because of the history that they had been taught, the erroneous history, the distorted history that they learned and given even more reinforcement through the popular cultural images that they're getting from films like Birth of a Nation, um, which then, as I said towards the end, glorifies the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, in which you see open terrorizing of black people celebrated by the filmmaker. Uh, it was not without controversy. The NAACP held, held rallies in the North and picketed showings of Birth of the Nation, but it made uh, thousands of dollars in its screenings in other cities, and Wilson later sort of backed off his earlier seal of approval of it and said it was unfortunate, some of the incidents in it, but nonetheless it stood and it stands, and, uh, it is a, uh, as I said, a great cultural text for us to read today. It's painful to watch, uh, given our sensibilities now in 2013, but it's a fascinating, as I said, cultural artifact, as is this. Gone with the wind. <laughs>